Um, it's not about you. I know it's about you, but it's not about you. It's yeah. about them. You'll benefit if you can solve problems. What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Creating Wealth Podcast, where I, Kyle, from Kyle Curtin Real Estate, interview local top dogs in the real estate investing, wealth building, and personal finance industries. Let's build together. What's up, guys? The guest on this week's episode of the podcast is absolutely awesome. James is the owner of Modern Property Solutions and has utilized some phenomenal alternate sources of funding to do real estate deals. In this episode, we get to jump into a bunch of really cool concepts, including digging into creative financing, in particular, seller financing and subject two, being able to achieve both wealth and give life-changing value to others, and so much more. This episode with James was an absolute blast, and I hope you enjoy. Let's jump right into the episode. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 80 of the Creating Wealth podcast. Today, we get the great pleasure of chatting with James Hartquist, a phenomenal user of creative financing and owner of Modern Property Solutions. What's going on, James? I'm super excited to have you on, man. How is yeah. everything going? Everything's good, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is cool. This is real cool. 100%, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's quite the intro. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so to kind of jump right into things, you know, if you could kind of tell us a little bit about your backstory and, and what kind of gave you the real estate bug. Um, yeah, you know, and, and just kind of what started the the journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, man, it, so I got, I feel like I got the real estate bug, like back when I was younger. Um, I don't know what year that first, that very first, like flip this house show came out with uh, Armando, Armando Montalongo. You remember that dude? Uh, <laughs> that was like the first one. I just remember watching that show on Saturday and I was like, you know, the intro to that show is like, you know, he rolled into town with like 32 cents in his pocket. Now he's got this giant house. And I was just fascinated by that. I was like, man, this is crazy. This dude like fixes up houses and resells them and like makes a ton of money. And I just remember like I used to tune in on Saturday morning, like at I don't know how old I was. I must have been like 12, 8, 10. I don't even know. <laughs> but I it just fascinated me. And and I would I would make sure that I'd watch that show. I'd watch the reruns. And um, you know, I I just I always felt like real I was drawn to real estate. Um but I think I avoided it when I was younger. Cause I was like, Oh, it just seems like it's such a, like a hard thing to break into. You know what I mean? Um, but like, yeah, I just, I've been into it since I was younger, even just like looking at property as we drive by and just being intrigued by, you know, how the houses were built and, you know, so I, I feel like it's, it's just been in my blood forever. And it's weird because like, I don't have, like none of my family, like immediate family members were in it. Like, my uncle owned some rental properties, but you know, I never had any like direct exposure. So yeah. That's super cool, man. No, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's awesome. You know what I mean? Like, like you said, like it, it like it might've just been in your blood and like, you know, you found out about it like years later, you know, and like discovered it at like a super early age and like you had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, when I finally transitioned into it, I was, you know, I was working uh, for the, town of Burlington Mass as a, you know, a custodian for the school department and, you know, second shift, you, you know, you're not around a lot of people. So I was like listening to a lot of podcasts and, you know, reading books and just trying to learn as much about it as I could. And that's when I sort of transitioned into it. Um, you know, when I say transitioned into it, I meant like, I was like, okay, I'm ready to like try to start buying houses or try to figure out a way to <laughs> be like a, you know, a big, bold real estate investor. Yeah. So, you know, that was probably I would say from like 2016 to 2018, like two years, I was just consuming as much information as I could and learning as much about it. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how I found creative financing and, um, you know, bought my first, uh, I guess, investment property. And then the second and then the third. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a cool transition for sure. That's huge, man. Especially, you know, to, 
be able to listen to like podcasts and stuff like that and like you know learn as much as you can you know like while you're you were doing your day job or night job I should say full time yeah for sure <laughs> um, yeah you know and like just use utilizing as much time as you could and, and just constantly absorbing and um I bet it must have been like the craziest thing in the world like once you started to hear about like the concepts of creative financing because like it's it's so interesting you know to your point of um you know, when you started to like first see like some of these TV shows and stuff like that and be thinking like, oh man, like this is like so hard to get into. Like, you know, I, I can't touch that for like years and years. And then to be able to hear about, you know, something that's very outside of the box that, you know, people can use to do some really crazy stuff. I imagine it must've been kind of game changing. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I think what drew me in was like the no money down. Like I didn't have a ton of money. I had a little bit, yeah. but you know, I, I always thought that there was like this huge entry to real estate as far as like being involved with buying properties. Um, and that was just, you know, a lack of knowledge. Um, but I was very drawn into like the no money down and, you know, free properties and all this stuff. And that's not quite true, but you know, you, you can buy properties without needing, you know, three or five or 10 or 20% or whatever, you know, ridiculous, um, you know, ridiculous things that the banks want. Yeah. Um, and I've learned how to do that. And it's kind of cool. Um, so for me, like the idea of buying a house in cash, for example, is far more overwhelming than buying a house on seller financing. Some people would be like, well, I feel the opposite. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it, yeah, it's cool. And, and I'd be, I've been able to structure some pretty cool deals and, you know, help some sellers out that were in like these really like strange positions and, and really may not have had solutions. Like if I didn't have the ability to offer creative financing. So, yeah, that's huge, man. Like, especially to be able to, you know, help out some people and get them out of like, you know, distress situations or whatever. And yeah, as well as, you know, making some decent returns and stuff like that. And, and like everybody's winning. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Um, it's funny. I, you know, I, I, what the, I don't know if it was a second or third, I think it was a third property I bought, you know, kind of towards the end when we closed, the guy was like, man, I didn't think, he's like, I didn't think this was going to work. <laughs> and it wasn't that uh, he didn't believe in what I could do. He was just, uh, you know, he was in arrears and, you know, I bought the property subject to the existing loan. So sub two. Um, so we, we were able to, you know, negotiate the arrears to, you know, be pushed onto the back end and, you know, he deeded the property to me and, you know, we started making payments and I think we're, we're about a year into that one now, you know, as far as like making payments on time. And I still talk to him, you know, once every couple of months we check in, he's a good guy. Um, but it was just funny. He said that. Cause you know, he was, he was really in arrears, like two years in arrears. Like you can imagine that's a pretty large chunk of money. Yeah. Um, but I was able to guide him and he, you know, when, it, when I originally had first talked to him, he was like, I'm just going to let the property go. Like I'm over it. I don't want to deal with it. It needs a lot of work. And I was like, man, I, you don't want the house anymore. I get it. Like why, but what if you like, what if you want to buy a truck in 12 months and your credit's cooked? Like let's, let's get this house out of pre foreclosure so that your credit isn't destroyed for the next seven years. Like even if you don't want the house anymore, like there's a bigger picture here. And he's like, Oh, I didn't think of that. Um, and, and now he's got, you know, 12 months of on-time payments that are showing. Um, and for anybody that's listening that doesn't, understand sub two, I'll try to give you just like a, a brief breakdown. Um, when you purchase the property subject to the existing loan, you close on the property as the owner, the financing stays in the current owner's name. So let's say you have a house, Kyle, you want to move it. I say, I'll buy it sub two. You deed the property to me. Financing stays in your name, but I own it. So I'm responsible for the payments just as it was, as it was mine. Whereas it's a sort of a suedo partnership. So um, that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. That's incredible, man. There's, yeah. um, I think it was episode 300 of the bigger pockets podcast. They interviewed, uh, Pace Morby. I know, um, he's definitely a guy who's super, super into, um, you know, like seller financing and stuff like that. And there was an analogy that he was talking about when it came to subject to that, that really kind of stuck with me, man. I thought it was pretty cool. Like he explained it, like basically, you know, like trying to buy like a truck or something like that. And like the concept of like, you know, like you're not going to buy like, well, I mean, some people might, but most people won't like, you're not going to buy like a $40,000 truck, like in cash, like right now, 
but like, you know, and be able to like finance it and stuff like that. And I, I don't know. I totally like butchered the crap out of the, out of his wonderful analogy, but. <laughs> no, I get it. So I have a, I have a, a man crush on Pace Morby. He's just, <laughs> he's just really good at creative financing and he's yeah. really good at explaining it. And he, his intentions are good. Um, I've, you know, I've learned a lot. I've learned more from his free content than I have from paid mentorships. So, um, he's a lot of what he does is, is a big part of what I do too. And I've learned quite a bit from him. So if anybody doesn't know who Pace Morby is definitely check him out. Um, because he will help you add, um, some dimensions to your real estate game that you don't even know about. So, you know, that's definitely shout out to Pace. So <laughs> that's huge, man. Awesome. So yeah. how, um, do you think that seller financing is, is something that can be used in like any market or is it kind of like, you know, from your experience, is it kind of like spotty and like really situation based and like that um, kind of thing? I, I think different niches of real estate work better in areas than others um, yeah. because every market's different. I think saying that, you know, any niche works like in any market, no matter where, no matter where you go is it's risky to say, I mean, can you find one sub two deal in any market? Yeah, probably. Can you build a business on just buying sub two deals in a, in a really high end market? Like let's say where we live, it's a little bit harder. Um, I think, yeah. um, you know, do I think that there's people who could, could have probably utilized seller financing and just didn't know about it? Yeah. I, I think that's the case too. So yeah, I, I guess I do think it can work in any market but I definitely think it works better in some markets than others. I really do think that. And I also think that it depends on obviously the motivation and the, the solution that you're trying to solve, you know, for the seller. Mm -hmm. So. That's cool. Yeah, no, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. You know what I mean? And like, it's, it's something that's really crazy that even like a lot of investors like don't know about it or like don't know enough about it. And it's uh, you know, if, if you're able to, if, or I should say like, if it's the right play for like the seller and stuff like that, then, you know, it, it could be something really special. Yeah. It sounds and, like. <laughs> and that you're right. And, you know, so I, I always try to lay out like multiple options and, and, you know, the options that I'll lay out for somebody is generally based on the questions that I'm asking in their situation. Um, obviously, uh, well, maybe it's obvious to me, but not to other people. So seller financing is, um, I don't know if it only would work. It doesn't, not necessarily would only work, but when I pitch seller financing, it's on a free and clear property, right? Like you could always sell or finance the equity. Obviously you could take it sub two or, you know, close on the property, take the deed and then uh, structure seller financing for the, for the equity. Um, but I generally will pitch seller financing to somebody or, or offer seller financing if it's free and clear. Um, and, you know, different sellers want different things. Like, if they want top price or they want more than what they, their house is actually worth, sometimes you can make seller financing work because really, as long as the, the property cash flows, you can take it. So you can pay a million dollars for a $300,000 house. If you can get a, you know, hundred year term, right? Yeah. Somebody will structure a note for a hundred years. You can pay them whatever they want. So I just tell people like, I can, I can pay you whatever you want on the property. As long as you give me the term length that I want. Ah, that's that's awesome. a little more advanced, but you know, really you you're looking for cash flow at that point, especially if you're planning on holding it forever. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's, that's my feeling on, on seller finance. And, and I'm not an expert by any means. Like I, I would say that I'm, my knowledge is like probably preschool level kindergarten at this point. Like <laughs> I know a little bit, but <laughs> there's definitely people out there that know more. And I try not to get into the habit of saying that I'm an expert because um, I feel like everybody out there says they're an expert and it, it, it takes away your ability to like continue learning, right? Like yeah. once you say you're an expert, it's almost like, well, I don't need to learn any more of this. Like I already know everything there is to know. Um, so I try to not put myself in that category. Yeah. I, I don't blame you at all, man. You know, it's, and it limits like, like open-mindedness and like, like ego starts to build up and it just, it, it turns into a bad thing. And you're right. Yeah. It's definitely something that's, that's really common in our environment, especially like, 
everybody's kind of got to be an expert in something, <laughs> you know? Like, and I think, you know, that comes from like uh, the insecurity of, well, gosh, if I only have a deal or two, the seller's going to think that I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, it's like the fake it till you make it um, disease. I think I, I, I don't know. I just, I would prefer to just be like, Hey, this is my first deal. Like take a shot on me. Like I'll take good care of you. Like I just yeah. feel like people will be more receptive to honesty than, you trying to be like, yeah, I've got 400 deals under my belt when you know that you're not telling the truth. (laughs) Exactly. So, (laughs) No, I totally agree with you, man. You know, and it's, I feel like in terms of sustain, the sustainability, that's the long word I was trying to say. (laughs) Um, Like if you're a hundred percent transparent and, you know, just tell them, like you said, like, Hey, you know, like this is my first deal. Like I'm still working things out. Like, you know, I feel like people are going to be a lot more relatable to that. You know, and like, if, if you tell people like, oh yeah, I've done like, you know, 20 of these last year and everything, like all it takes is like something to slip up and then like, you're fully exposed and now you're toast, you know what I mean? And like, (laughs) yeah, totally. it's it's not worth taking the risk. Yeah. And I've had people that have been, you know, cause like I said, I've not done a million deals, um, but I've, I've had people say like, Hey, like we're concerned about this. And I'm like, Hey, I get it. Like if I'm not your guy, that's fine. But just so you know, like I have. I have people that know way more about this than I do that are sort of at my disposal. Like I can call a guy right now and answer literally any question that you have. So like yeah. I have people, I'm just not the people yet. <laughs> and and most people are like, Oh, okay, cool. Like if I don't know the answer, I'll get it. And exactly. People, people relate to that. You know, it's being relatable. Like, like you said, I totally agree with you, man. Like it's, that's something that I definitely try and push being like, so very, very early into things is like, like we all get to start somewhere, you know what I mean? And like, like it's, I feel like that's a conversation that not a lot of people really want to have is like how to like start in the very, very beginning. And then like when people ask like, Oh, like how many deals have you done? Oh, well, like this is my first one or like, I don't know, because to your point, like, I think like people might be afraid that it does discount credibility, but in the same token, like, like everybody starts from, from nothing, you know what yeah. I mean? And you have to build up and like, you know, everybody wants to have all these deals flying around everywhere and making all this money and everything. And you can, it's going to take a while to get there, but it's like, I, I feel like nobody really wants to to talk about like the very, very beginning that often, you know? And, yeah. I, I think a lot of times um, mentors are obviously mentors because they've been, well, at least in theory, <laughs> They're, they're mentors because they've been doing it for a long time and they've had great success. Um, but when you're first starting out, like you really need your handheld, like, yeah. And you have to remember like how hard it was. Like I'll hear mentors say, just hire a virtual assistant and, you know, have them generate leads. And I'm like, yeah, cool. But like, if you don't even know how to make calls, like how can you train a virtual assistant to make calls? Like, Uh it's one of those things I'm like, come on, like, get good at making calls, learn the business, put the work in. Mm-hmm. And then once you Delegate get it. it, then you can hire somebody. So yep. little things like that. But I, I, you know, I agree it's, but it, from, from their perspective, like they're probably thinking like, gosh, I wish somebody had said to me, like, just hire a VA. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, I, I understand both. I understand both sides, but you know, but I, I know what you're saying for sure. Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, to your point, like, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of people like preach that kind of thing of like, oh, you know, like you don't want to make cold calls, just hire a VA and then hire another one and everything's going to be hunky dory and it's going to be fine. And it's and, like, you can, and you can try, but like, you know, the, it's probably not going to be worth it. I mean, in terms of like, like quantity and, and time versus how much you're paying, like maybe, yep. but in terms of quality, uh, I don't know, man, you know, like. Yeah. And it takes a completely different skill set to manage like a team of VAs than it does to just sit down and make calls. Exactly. And I listen, I've learned that the hard way. Like I've had VAs and, you know, I've had, I've had VAs who have had some success at, you know, generating leads. And, you know, in some cases, like I've been the bottleneck, like not being able to convert. Um, and then other times I've had lead, you know, VAs that were like saying they were making calls and they weren't. So like I've experienced it all. And, and as of like right now today, like I don't, I'm not, I have one VA. He does admin stuff he does our website stuff um and and that's that's really it yeah but you're right like the cold calling that stuff's all cool it works but it's really it's a it's a tough thing to delegate until you have a lot of experience and you've gotten really good at managing people 
and you have the systems in place to be able to like help make them better. And I thought I had that stuff, but I, I didn't because they, they weren't successful. So, you know, ultimately my, my responsibility and my failure, but I also learned quite a bit. So if we ever go down that, that road again, which I don't think we will, um, I, I'll approach it differently. So. Of course, you know, and I, I mean, I feel like that's kind of, you know, a, a big thing for pretty much like any business, you know what I mean? Like, it's really tough to just kind of like delegate something out if like, you have no idea of like what's going on. Like, yeah, you can't totally. just like give somebody a vision and be like, just go do it. Like, I'll pay you for it. Like, figure it out. Like, you know, you'll be good. Yeah. Like you, I don't know. I mean, like, so I have a, um, a virtual assistant to, that I have been using to edit like the podcast and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And like things have been going really well, but like I was at it in the podcast since I started like, like a year and a half ago and probably had them for like a couple months now. And like, I, I don't know, like I couldn't really picture it any other way of like having to go through like all the troubles and dealing with like the problems my computer was giving me and like, like just trying to do everything myself and absolutely struggling. Like, I'm glad that I struggled. So then, you know, now you can iron out all that crap, like right off the bat and try and create like the standard operating procedure, you know, to be able to go through that and like figure out how you want it and then pair the experience that you got from doing all that stuff that you totally don't want to do anymore and pairing that with your vision for what you want it to be and then handing it off to, you know, somebody who's a lot stronger in those areas. And I mean, like you've already dealt with a good amount of the problems, you know, I mean, you're always going to deal with more problems, but like, it's going to be like higher level problems, I guess you could say, you know, cause you've already kind of been through uh, some of the crap. <laughs> yeah. Know? And I, I think too, um, the one thing that, and, and I real estate investors in particular are just very cheap when it comes to, and that's not a diss. I I'm, I've been there, yeah. um, but like anything, like you get what you pay for, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but real estate investors and probably realtors too, will hire a VA thinking like, okay, I'm paying this person, whatever it is, let's call it 600 bucks a month. Right. Yeah. Which like, you're looking at it, like it's a car payment. Right. But, but when you think about it, like for four, eight, 12, 160 hours a month of work, like it's really not a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but it takes like three to six months for somebody to really grasp like their position. Right. So you really have to give them time to like get in there and learn and, um, like learn your ways, right? Like, yeah. you know, you've hired this person now, they're not going to edit the podcast. They're probably going to listen to this. They're going to hear us roasting them. So whatever your VA is. <laughs> I love you, is, Christian. Shout yeah, out. We love you, Christian. <laughs> love um, you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but it, there's, there's a learning curve, right? Um, because yeah. he's going to be, or she, they're going to be different at doing things, you know, uh, different at doing it the way you do it. So, you know, there's a, there's an adjustment there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also you learning to manage them and, and, uh, fix things and, and, you know, continue to move in the right direction. But yeah, that's cool. Um, I, I, I love that you're delegating that stuff. Um, yeah. Editing stuff like that would give me anxiety. So that would be the yeah. first thing I would delegate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I feel you, man. It's, it's literally one of like the best decisions I've ever made. Um, and I still have a lot of work to do. And like, I still have a lot of like life lessons to learn about like managing people and like, and like responsiveness and, you know, delegating out more of it and kind of, you know, put myself in a position that I, I really want to be in, um, you know, and kind of stepping back as much as I can. And, you know, just being able to kind of delegate it out to those who are like much more skilled at it and yeah. be able to, you know, pay them very nicely, you know, to, uh, to be able to, to carry out the vision, you know, that I'm looking for and work with them and stuff. But I mean, like, that's, that's something that, <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, joking out there. With that COVID um, off. <laughs> um, and I mean, like, that's something that I've been learning a lot about recently is like, you know, basically building up these visions and like these companies and like, you know, having all these things going on at some point, like you need to delegate, like you're going to go absolutely crazy and get burnt out. And like, everything's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, you know, one of the, so I, I, I never used to be like really good at like managing or really interacting with people. Um, I read a book and it, it, literally everybody on the planet knows this book, but 
Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. And you know, what's funny is I, I do audiobooks because I have trouble focusing when I actually read actual words on, in a book. Mm -hmm. But the first time I listened to that book, it didn't really resonate with me. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like I get it. Um, this all makes sense. I'm, it works. Um, but I, I wasn't as receptive to it because I don't think I was ready for it yet. But I listened to it again recently and I've been implementing and, and, and using that even just like when I deal with somebody at the grocery store and it blows my mind how well the stuff in that book works. Um, so if you're somebody out there that's having trouble interacting or, or delegating, that's a great book to, you know, kind of help you learn how to, uh, you know, interact with those people who need, who need you to be a little more supportive and, and understanding. So it was big. It was a big, it was a game changer for me. So. I totally agree, man. That, that book is extremely good. I haven't read it in a couple of years, actually. I, I have to, I have to get back on that bandwagon, but yeah, you know, it's that what that book has been so, so influential and like, it's, uh, you know, definitely one of the really, really, you know, big ones out there for, for influencing like a lot of mindset and, and action and stuff. Another yeah. one that, you know, is kind of along the same vein is the, uh, the go-giver. I've, so I've heard of that one and I've, I've not uh, taken the time to go through it yet. It's on my list though. That one is a, a pretty good one, man. It's um, it's a very short book too. It's, I, I mean, I don't know how many hours it would take to listen to it, but it's, it's very, very short, yeah. but like the lessons in it are, uh, awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah, like it's a lot I'll of like, out. yeah, you know, it's a lot of, um, you know, basically a book about like giving value and like, you know, taking value and like, you know, things come in full circle with like helping people out and like not expecting anything in return. And like, it's, it's a lot of that type of stuff. And it's actually based around, um, like a fiction like story and it's 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 just cool man like whenever you get around to it it's it's a super good book i highly recommend it it's a big yeah. like growth like type of book and stuff it's cool i love that yeah i'll definitely check that out um and i i will say too you just said something that kind of sparked the thought um giving value and giving without expecting in return yeah i do that a lot like in my personal life like with people and just you know i try to help out as much as i can i like it i yeah. i'm sure i do it more for me than them even though we both benefit because it makes me feel good yeah. But what I, I had sort of a, an aha moment with my business where I realized that I was looking at everything like from a very like rigid mathematical standpoint. I'm like, if the numbers don't work, like I'm not interested. And I was like, I need to chill out a little bit and just be more empathetic to the person on the other end of the phone <clears throat> that's having whatever issue they're having. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it didn't necessarily like translate into like, a bunch of extra money and all these like deals. It wasn't like this, you know, uh, crazy, like avalanche of, of, you know, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But what I started receiving, uh, you know, were people that were just grateful for the conversations and some people that I talk to don't need what I can offer as a real estate investor. Yeah. So I make the conversations more about them than about me now. And it's led to things that aren't like dollar value, but like positive reviews on like Google reviews from like people that are just like, Hey, James, is a good dude. Like you can trust him. He'll help you. Like he cares. And that stuff's important. You know what I mean? Um, like I had a woman who left a bad review on my Google reviews. It was for another company also called modern property solutions. And I knew right away what was going on. And I was just, I was like, I got to get this lady to just like understand that I'm not the guy that she thinks you know, she just had the wrong person. Yeah. So she called me. I left my cell phone number literally on the Google review and she called me and we talked for like an hour and she ended up changing that into a positive review. And I had that hour conversation with her and it was just me not advising or guiding, but just gently like offering solutions to her problems with no yeah. expectation in return. But if at some point she wants help wholesaling or, um, you know, selling her property in Florida on um, seller financing or whatever it is, I'm here. Yeah. So, so it was just cool to be able to offer that without expecting anything in return. So I, you know, that's, that's big for newer real estate investors and really real estate agents out there too. Um, it's not about you. I know it's about you, but it's not about you. It's yeah. about them. You'll benefit if you can solve problems. I love that so much, man. Yeah. And like even boiling it down to like, 
even if like you're, you're, you know, at like a meetup or something or like out networking or having like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, like, you know, like people are coming to you, like maybe that are newer to things or aren't as strong, you know, in a particular like niche or, or area quite yet, um, you know, that you might've been like working in for a while, like just to be able to like give value and like, just to help them out. Like that's something that like, if, if you can do that on a large scale, like that's something that I've seen in, you know, some, some pretty successful people, you know what I mean? Like just being willing to just help people and like, you know, move on and just keep, keep helping people out and everything. And like, it, it's a really interesting dy uh, dynamic because I mean, in a way, like, you know, investors are, are trying to make returns. Right. But also there's a whole nother element to that of like, like actually being a human and growing and growing together. And it's really interesting because like, if you're just thinking about the money, then like, you're not going to actually be helping people out the way that you could if you weren't. But if you're looking to like help people out, then like the money will come eventually. Like it's, it's like the weirdest freaking thing, yeah. man. Like, <laughs> and it's spot you know? on. I, I think that comes from like, you know, like really high performers that we follow guys like you and I follow. Yeah. It's all like, it's all about like time blocking and you got to guard your time. And you know, if you won't, you know, you want, you don't want to make calls on this time or take calls on this time. You just block it out and you turn your phone off. And so I think it comes from that, like rigid, like, you know, uh, you got to protect your time and not waste, waste. I say waste um, because I know sometimes people think that it's a waste of time to have a conversation with some, you know, nice woman in Florida who, you know, is not going to turn into a deal, but she's grateful for the conversation. Like to some people, that'd be a waste of time. To me, yeah. it's invaluable because now I have this positive review that she left, right. That, that says from her perspective, um, how she feels about my character yep. and, and, you know, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Uh, so for me, that's more valuable than money. Like some people might be like, yeah, cool, bro. Like positive re reviews don't pay the bills, but you know, that's, that's why, that's why I do this. I do this to help people. And it took me a, a minute to realize that, um, you know, because everybody gets into real estate to make money. Like yeah. everybody says they get into real estate to help people, but they get into real estate because they want to, you know, be wealthy. They want to have money. They want to have properties, you know, they want to have that time freedom. Um, but there's a way to achieve both. And it starts with the problems you solve, not just doing a bunch of deals and, and making a bunch of money. Exactly. Yeah. I love it, man. It's, it's so much bigger than, than just the money. Like I, I talk about it quite a bit on the podcast because it, it usually comes up a lot, which I love, but <laughs> yeah. um, basically like, so one thing that, that really sticks into my mind, you know, to your point is like a lot of people that I have had conversations with, like, you know, other investors and stuff, like, you know, just shooting the breeze and, and getting to know each other, like that kind of thing. Like just in conversation, like the amount of times that like one single sentence from one conversation with one person has totally like drastically like spun me in a 180 and going in a completely different direction, like in a good way. Mm -hmm. Like, like I can remember some of the like exact conversations and like where I was and everything. Cause like it totally changed my life, you know? And like, if you're the person on the other end of the phone, like that doesn't think anything of it. And like, you're just, you know, telling people, you know, about this thing because it's, you know, like you might've did it or like, you know, heard it, whatever, like learned about it. Like you don't think twice about it, but to the other person that, yeah, like you might not be monetarily like tied to, or like, you know, a client or a, a prospect or, or what have you, like, not only could you get like really, really crazy satisfaction, but like, you could have like totally changed their lives, like for generations, you know? And yeah. like, for me, like, like, I'm so thankful for like all the conversations that, you know, like people have on, on a daily basis, like just to shoot the breeze and help each other out and everything that like, I feel like it's, it's like my personal obligation to like, even try to be like a percentage of like, like giving back like that and like having as many of those conversations and like saying those like one-off things that like, you don't think anything of until the other person like stops dead in their tracks and is like, dude, like it works that way. You know, like it's cause it's like the craziest thing in the world, man. Like this stuff is nuts. Like, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. And I've thought about that 
I've thought about that in the past, like, you know, conversations that I have, like, did it alter somebody in like a, a negative or a positive direction? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I try to be really aware of, of those conversations because I'm trying to obviously uh, improve people's lives, you know, in both real estate and personally. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's, that's, it's cool that you said that. And I've, I've thought about that in the past myself. Um, and it's good that you're aware of that. Like, you know, you're in your early twenties, right? Yeah. I'll be yeah. uh 22 next month. Yeah. Like the fact that you're aware of that right now is, is really impressive. So you should be proud of yourself for that. Ah, thanks man. <laughs> <laughs> so James question for you. I love to ask this question every time because <laughs> it, it kind of makes people think a little bit. Mm -hmm. How do you define wealth? Um, so I think I break it down sort of into two ways. Um, from the money perspective, it's to me, wealth is time freedom. Mm -hmm. It's being able to spend your time doing whatever you want because you have, whether it's savings I know people say cash is trash, but if you have reserve accounts, savings, and you can do things while, you know, living off those savings, I know it's not ideal, but it gives you time freedom yeah. um, or passive, right? So that, so for me, like, that's what I'm looking for is the, the passive that allows me to, you know, um, not have to work that job if I don't want to, or, you know, not have to do this you know, because I, because I need the money. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I, to me, it's like people wealth is more important. It's the network yes. and it's enriching people's lives in a way um, that, that helps them improve and also be able to kind of branch out and do the same thing for others. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, like I try to give compliments more now to people who do a good job. Cause I don't think there's enough people out there saying, Hey man, like you did a good job. Like you should be proud of yourself. Um, everybody's very focused on the negative. So to me, like that's wealth, like, like recognizing those things and, and um, you know, being able to like make people feel good. Like to me, that's wealth. Like I know people say wealth and money, but I think it's bigger than that. I really do. I totally agree with you, man. And it's really funny that you say that about like the compliments. Cause I was talking to, um, to someone a while back and like, it, it was just a guy that, uh, you know, I, I met through like a mutual friend and we were just shooting the breeze, having a conversation. Like he was another investor and, uh, he was telling me, he's like, dude, like, you know what will totally change your life? I'm like, no, what's that? He's like, if you compliment one person every single day, he's like, okay. if you try that, like, like crazy things will happen. Yeah. And it's like, it's something that's stuck in my head. And like, it's something I have to work on a lot, you know, like I heard it and like, I wrote it down and everything, but I don't know. I, I haven't actually like tried to put it into practice. Cause like, it, it is like a little uncomfortable. Like just, yeah. You know, Especially like for dudes. Strangers. Like <laughs> we, well, dudes, like we don't like really compliment each other. It's not no. just like, <laughs> like we roast each other. That's what we do. <laughs> like, that's just like, there's like two you your boys like you know, group, like the group chats on facebook are wild you know <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> um, like i work with a guy and you know he's really good at a particular part of the business and i'm like dude like you're you're like the you know the you're the king of that man and you're like you're legit like you do good work he's like no 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 i'm like dude no you do like he's like oh i appreciate that like he was just like blown away that somebody took the time to like you know uh like acknowledge that he's really good at this and yeah. it you know he's when i say he's a helper he's not a foreman i'm i'm a foreman on the you know i do uh, data cabling uh, mm -hmm. you know low voltage data cabling in addition to real estate stuff um so when i say he's a helper he's just not a foreman but you know he, now on these job sites he's like running through walls for me does anything i ask you know yeah um and it's just because i took a second to acknowledge and and give him a compliment on on the work that he does that's a real compliment he does great work and um you know tell people like if you appreciate what they do tell them even if it feels weird just tell them yeah it's crazy man i, I think you're totally right like I, I feel like there isn't enough of that in the world you know yeah. like everything's all negative and like people trying to be better than each other and shoot each other down and everything and this that the other and like the power of like one compliment like damn you know yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah yep 
and I'm not always good at it. You know what I mean? Like it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't so, just you know, happen, you know? Yeah. No, I love it. And, and on the flip side though, I'm not great at taking compliments. And that's also something I've been, I've been working on, um, you know, cause I think taking a compliment too is important. So, um, and I think a lot of people are probably worse, even though they're probably not great at giving them, they're probably worse at taking them. You know what yeah. I mean? So, um, just some things I've been working on lately. It's, you know, it, and it's, I've seen an, an, it's, I've seen a, uh, um, a, a positivity shift in myself. And I've also seen how people respond to me. And it sort of goes back to, you know, how to win friends and influence people yeah. like that book. It's, it's a lot of that stuff. So it's all stuff I'm implementing right now. And it's, yeah, it's been great. So it's, that sounds pretty awesome, man. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely have to revisit that. Um, you know, kind of what that guy was, was telling me about and stuff like that. And yeah, it just, it sounds really powerful. Yeah. It's cool. I dig it a lot. Definitely. So James, I got one question for you and it actually stems right off of uh, us talking about a couple of books. The question that I usually ask is, do you read? And what is your favorite business investing or real estate book that you would recommend to anyone? Yeah. So I, I'm an audio book guy. Um, I, I haven't mastered being able to sit down and actually read a physical book. I just get really distracted with. I don't blame you, man. I, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> audio books. I can like listen when I drive and when I work. And um, so the, 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 I think the one like game changing book for me where I was like, all right, yes, real estate. And okay. I understand money like differently than I ever have in the past is rich dad, poor dad. Like yeah. I, I've can't, out of all the books that I've ever, cause this question gets asked a lot on different podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, rich dad, poor dad is like, from my perspective, the most referenced book for that. Um, you know, just the, the, the lessons learned in that book, that one in cash flow quadrant, whenever I'm personally like not in a good place, because real estate's up and it's ups and downs, as you know, Definitely. <laughs> especially when you're an investor, like, you know, you have great, like you'll have a great couple of weeks or a great month. And then, you know, you might be in the dumps for like six months, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's my go-to. I always listen to one of those two audiobooks, either, either Rich Dad, Poor Dad or, or Cashflow Quadrant. And it always like snaps me back into it. And it makes me realize like why, like what, like kind of lit the fire under my butt for getting into real estate. Um, so that's a big one. Um, one minute, one minute millionaire. Um, that one is fantastic. Um, what else? Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, Harv T. Eckler. That's a, uh, that's a great one. And then, as I mentioned, how to win friends and influence people. And yeah. I think an, another underrated one is uh, a book called The Pumpkin Plan by Mike Michalowicz. He's the author that wrote Profit First. Oh, more, okay. More people are probably familiar with Profit First. Um, he wrote a book called the pumpkin plan that is, um, centered around you working with the customers or clients that you want specifically, rather than just like taking any and all. Hmm. Um, so it's a great way to, uh, identify who your kind of ideal client is or your avatar. A lot of people use that term avatar and how to implement it. So that, that's, that was a, a really good one for me as well. That's super I, I gave cool, you a through there a few, but <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's, that's phenomenal. I, there yeah. was a couple in there that, um, that I've heard of like the one minute millionaire. I, I haven't read. And there was another one in there too. I forget. I think uh, it was secrets of the millionaire mind. Yeah. I yeah, haven't those read are those two things. really good ones. Um, one minute millionaire is an interesting one. Cause it's, it's like principles to become wealthy, but then mm -hmm. also, so it's essentially two books in one. So there's the, the, these, you know, however many chapters of principles to kind of learn how to manage your money and, and get wealthy by real estate and this and all that. But then there's also a story and it's, it's about a, a woman who uh, I won't, I won't throw too much out cause I don't <laughs> want to ruin the story, but she has uh, quite a few things in her life that she has to overcome. She loses her husband then she uh, loses her kids to uh, the grandparents. Um, they, they take them and, she has to get them back and she has to do certain things to get them back. And it's, it's just about how she learns how to open her mind uh, to learning how to make money and, and build business, build businesses just by being creative and, you know, utilizing a team, leveraging a team. So um, incredible book. Like you'll, it, you'll get emotional listening to 
it's a fake story, but you'll get emotional listening to it. Cause it's, it'll, yeah. it'll definitely tug at your heart. So that's uh, cool, man. Yeah. It's, it's a good one. So. Yeah. That, that sounds like a really good one. I, I really like those kind of books, like the, um, you know, like, like the more like business, like entrepreneurial, but like it's tied behind a story. Yep. So like the, uh, like the rich, uh, richest man in Babylon. Yep. Um, and then like the go-giver is another one. And that that's cool, man. I, I didn't know there was uh, kind of another one out there. So you know, there was... I have a theory that the, that rich dad, poor dad is a rewrite of the richest man in Babylon that I don't know if that's ever been said before. Maybe it has. But there's a lot of the same principles in both. And if you, I listened to them back to back once. And I was like, man, this is a lot of the same stuff, um, but modernized so that yeah. we can understand it today. Um, it so, probably is, man. And yeah. even um, like they might have stole stuff from like, uh, well, I shouldn't say stole borrowed. stuff. That sounds bad, but <laughs> all right, borrowed. <laughs> that works. <laughs> um, from like Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, same. You know, like same some thing. of these books that were written in like I don't I don't even know when it was like the 30s or like yeah. some crap like that. You know, like it's it's cool. You know what I mean? Because like to your point, like if those principles like really work, like something that really works is going to keep getting carried over and over and over and over again. You well, know, they're like, repeated, oh. right? Like you see them repeated in a lot of different yeah uh, situations where people are super successful, and I, you know, history repeats for a reason, and and you know, I, I, these books are definitely foundational, you know, things yeah. that, that everybody should, um, at least be planning on getting to at some point, you know, Yeah. but it's interesting because I've listened to them and I'm like, eh, and then I'll re-listen to it. And I'm like, Oh my God, it blew, blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. But whatever, you know, whatever obstacle I was facing, you know, two years ago when I read that book, it, it didn't, it didn't resonate at the time, but now there is an obstacle I'm trying to fix and or i'm trying to get over and now it's you know now it's more relevant and i'm like oh my god like this is incredible so you know i've and uh like i'll give you um jocko willink's book um is it extreme ownership yeah so great book the first time i listened to it and then the second time i was like yep that's me yep i didn't take ownership of that so it was just about me like being like james you're the bottleneck like you're the problem it's not other people it's you yeah. And, and it was like, a, you know, I gave myself a spanking because I knew at that point. So, it you know, it didn't resonate with me the first time, but it did the second time. So that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely love that. And like, I think that's something that's really interesting is like, you know, reading like the same books at different parts in your journey can like yeah. drastically change like the amount of impact it has on you, even though yep. like the words aren't going to change, you know, like it's the same book same that's been sitting on your yeah. shelf, but the impact could like, either like not touch you or it could like punch you in the face, you know, yeah. and like, like knock you on your behind, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's cool. I, I like that, you know, and it, uh, I mean, different, like all these kind of books and stuff are going to affect different people at different times. You know what I mean? And whatever things they have going on at the time. And it, uh, if it hits you at the right point, like it could just totally oh my God, like change everything. You know? Yeah. And, and for me right now, it's definitely how to win friends and influence people. You know, I, yeah. I was like one of those guys that was always like calling people out when they were wrong. And like, I was right. And like, it's cool to be right sometimes, but like, you don't make any friends doing that. And, <laughs> and then when like, you need somebody to have your back, they're like, no way, dude. Like you called me out on something like, and yeah. like, yeah, you were right. But you know, there's a, a better way to handle it. And now that I've been implementing this stuff from like how to win friends and influence people, it's like everything is just opening up for me. Right. And people are yeah. more receptive and it's just, it's, it's much nicer. <laughs> so it's know, a growth just, thing. Yeah, totally. You know, and like to be able to tell as many people as we can, like about, you know, these kind of resources and stuff, man, like it, it could totally change everything. You know what yeah. I mean? And absolutely. It, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. But Thank you so, so, so much for coming on here, James. We're, um, we're on like social media and stuff. Can you and, and the company and where can you be found? <laughs> yeah. So first off, thank you for having me on. Um, I, I really respect what you're doing. Uh, you know, consistently podcasting is hard. It um, is. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. So I, I definitely appreciate the work you've put in and I really appreciate you having me on. Um, I'm on Facebook. You can find me James Hartquist. I'm on Instagram. J Hart. I think I'm J Hartquist on Instagram. H E A R T Q U I S T. 
Um, my website is modernpropertysolutions.com. Um, you can call my cell 781-475-8055. Uh, one of the things I'll just say this quickly, we're launching, I would say in the next probably 60 days is a resource page for realtors um, just from the investing side. Cause I think realtors, um, I don't want to say they don't know enough, but they're not exposed enough to the, to the investor side yeah. and the uh, creative financing options that could potentially help like sellers that where a realtor may not be able to help. Like you may turn a lead away for whatever reason. Um, so we're, we're launching a, like a, a realtor uh, resource page and you, you know, you'll be able to find that on the website, modern property solutions. It'll probably, probably literally be labeled realtor referral or not realtor referral, uh, mm -hmm. realtor resources page. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you can email me James at modern property solutions. If you have just any questions about creative financing, if you know, something pops up with a deal, you're like, I don't know what to do with this deal. I can take a look at it. Um, I've, you know, have a pretty decent network now. So if I can't help, I might know somebody that can. Um, so yeah, reach out to me. I, I, you know, if you just want to shoot the breeze, give me a call. That's awesome, man. Thank yeah. you so, so much. I'm yeah. very excited about that. Um, that resources page. Yeah. It's super um, exciting. Yeah. It's, I, I really think it's something that will, you know, and it, it I think it's something that's going to be very helpful to realtors if, if they'll take five minutes to read it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's sort of this like, like vampire versus werewolves war with like realtors and investors. <laughs> and I, I don't understand it because like, I really think we're on the same team. I truly believe that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I'm hoping that I can sort of bridge some of that gap where, you know, realtors can understand that, you know, the investor side can actually bring a lot of value and also vice versa. So, um, you know, the sharing of leads and pushing people into the right direction for what's best for them and not what's best for us. Yeah. It sort of goes back to that. So. Awesome. I love that, man. I, I can't wait to, to see that. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you. I'll share it with you so, as soon so. as it's done. <laughs> oh, sweet. A hundred percent. I'll drop all that stuff below guys. Um, definitely reach out to James. He's a phenomenal guy doing awesome stuff. Um, and, and yeah, you know, thank you so, so, so much for coming on here again, man. That was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. All right, guys, that concludes our creating wealth podcast episode for today. I want to thank every single person that has listened this far. It really means a lot to know that people can learn from me and with me as we build wealth together. Hopefully you can take home at least one thing from this podcast that will improve your life just a little bit. If you could, please check me out on social. That's at Kyle Curtin Real Estate on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm on Bigger Pockets. Until next time, let's build together.